Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. Thank you because you brought us together to worship you. Thank you because you have made us to endure whatever physical condition and yet to come on this day of worship. We pray, O Lord, that the interest we show in coming to your house to worship you, whether rain falls or sun is shining, we pray that you will bless our faithfulness in Jesus' name. And we pray that our appearance in your presence will not be in vain. Speak to our hearts even now. Let your blessings continue in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Today as we come together, we want to consider what message the Lord has for us. In John chapter 4, reading from verse 34 and verse 35. Something had already happened in this chapter that brought out the words that Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples. And because of the things that had happened and what the disciples themselves were thinking, Jesus Christ had to bring forth something very central, very essential in his own life and ministry. He came to the side of the well, like he came to the world. A woman came that had been bound in sin. Just like the whole world had been full of sin, filled with sin, bound with sin. The woman did not realize that Jesus Christ was to bless her. Just like the whole world did not realize and the whole world does not realize today the blessing that Jesus Christ has brought uh, for the world. And it was Jesus Christ that initiated the discussion saying, Give me water to drink. And you will know that it is God that has first revealed and shown his love for the world. He loved us, therefore now we want to respond and love him. And then the woman began to argue. And the world also does not simply just receive the Lord and the salvation of the Lord. Many people in the world will argue first before the taste of the blessing of the Lord. And then the Lord Jesus Christ offered blessing. That's exactly what the world is waiting for. But the woman was thinking it was a physical thing. You will drink of this water and you will not thirst again. The world is running after physical blessing rather than spiritual blessing. And then Jesus Christ made the condition to this woman. Go and call your husband. And you know that the world has uh, prostituted its love. Instead of loving God the Creator, the world loves other things. That brought a confession from the woman. And the woman began to say, I have no husband. And the world must come to a confession. Before the Lord Jesus Christ will present the water of life. Eventually Jesus Christ began to reveal the dirty, polluted, defiled life of this woman to her. And that's what will start for us. The Spirit will come. It's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I go not away, the Spirit will not come. But when He comes, He will convict the world of sin. As the woman began to confess her sin, then she realized eventually that Jesus Christ is that Lord, is that Messiah. It is when the world comes to the confession of their sin and the confession of the Savior that the salvation will come. Meanwhile, the disciples of Jesus were not around. And eventually, the disciples came. And they were wondering why Jesus would be speaking to this woman. That's the attitude of the Jewish nation. They are wondering why God should be presenting his love for the world of sinners, the Gentiles. Meanwhile, this woman had been born again, had been saved. And she became the messenger of the Lord and went to the town saying, Come see a man that told me everything that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? It's exactly what happens when somebody from the world, coming from the world, comes to Christ. And you know Christ and it changes your life. You go back to that world and you begin to exalt and publicize Christ and bring them to the Lord. Meanwhile, the disciples were still wondering. And therefore Jesus Christ had to talk to the disciples. Telling them the very essence of his coming into the world. And then transferring that vision unto them. And wanting them to manifest the same dedication to the work of the Lord, to the ministry of evangelization, as he was manifesting. Look at it now, chapter 4. John, verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Today we are talking on consecration for the latter day harvesting. Consecration for latter day harvesting. The Lord Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. My food that I enjoy. 
my food that sustains my life, my food that keeps me here, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The work of God is as necessary as the food we eat. The work of God is the thing that keeps us alive, we as believers, as the food keeps us alive. The continuation of our existence here on earth depends on the food we eat, and the continuation of our life in the kingdom depends on the work we're doing in the kingdom. There are many things we can do without every day, but we cannot do without food every day. There are things we may need to give up in our lives and deny ourselves of, but to deny ourselves permanently of food, that will be difficult, that will be suicidal. That means then that the work of God is very central, is very important. There are things in life we can push aside, but the food we eat that keeps us in existence, we cannot do without that. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. One of the reasons why we learn anything, one of the reasons why we work, one of the reasons why we are active in the world is to be able to get some money and feed ourselves and provide food for ourselves. What the food is to the life, the work of God is to the life of the believer. And one of the reasons we listen to messages and sermons and talk and everything and come over here to learn is so that that now can lead us to go and do the work which is like meat unto us. It is a food that gives us strength. It is the work of God that emboldens, encourages, and strengthens the believer. He was talking to them about himself. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. While he was talking to his disciples, the message that the woman gave to the people in Samaria in the town had been effectively received. He had told them, come see a man. That's in verse 29. We told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Already they were coming. And they were coming in their large multitude. Sinners who had never seen Christ. Religious people who did not know the Messiah had come. They were coming from all directions of the city. And while they were coming, Jesus looked up and saw them. And then he said in verse 35, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? He said, Behold, look at them. I say unto you, lift up your eyes. They were looking at him while he was talking to them. But Jesus saw that the Samaritans were coming already. And as he looked at them coming, he told his disciples, Look up, behold, lift up your eyes and look. He said, Look on the fields. The field is the world. When you are talking of the physical thing, you are planted and uh, the wheat or the corn or whatever it is has grown up and you know now is the time for harvesting. And then he said, look on the fields now, look at the world, for they are white or ready to harvest. If you understand the language of Jesus Christ, he was talking about the people that were coming and these people, they needed to be invested into the kingdom of God and he said, there is no delay. Are you saying there is still four months and the harvest will come? Look up and behold, it's ready now, the harvest is ready. He was calling them to consecration, to dedication. He was calling them for latter day harvesting. And that's what the Lord is calling us today to is telling us, look up. You may think that the Samaritans are hard hearted. You may think that the Samaritans are wishy washy religious people. You may think that the Samaritans are the people that are not pure Jews and not pure Gentiles and they mix a lot of traditional things with religion. You may think that all these people you are looking at on the street, they are really not serious in wanting the Lord to be their Savior, and therefore you are saying it is not their time yet, and the Lord is saying, look up and see them, they are ready white for harvest. Let's very quickly talk about three points in our message. Number one, the scope and the extent of the harvest. If you look at Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 36. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Multitudes of spiritually blind people. Multitudes of spiritually paralyzed people. Multitudes of uh, deceived people. Multitudes of unsaved, hardened sinners. Multitudes of religious but unrighteous people. 
multitudes of people that scatter into many places of worship, but they do not know the Lord as their Savior. Multitudes of hopeless people, if they died like that, they died without hope. He saw them and he was moved with compassion, because they fainted and they were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Nobody to bring them into any shelter. Nobody to bring any protection to them. Nobody to feed them with the bread of life. Nobody to lead them to the great shepherd of the soul. Then in verse 37, Then said he to his disciples, The harvest really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He says, The laborers are few. You must be wondering why the laborers are few. Because if you look at the, the gospel according to St. Matthew from chapter 4, you will find that Jesus Christ went into Jerusalem, Capernaum, everywhere, and he healed many of them, and many of them came to know him. Many of those people that were healed, they never became soul winners. The laborers are few. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, he preached unto them. At the end of that message, it says, they wondered and they marveled at what he said. Many of those people that had the greatest message ever preached never became soul winners. That's why he said the laborers are few. If you recall in your mind Matthew chapter 8, you will find that he healed the leper. Then he healed many people during the evening. They brought everybody to him. He healed every one of them. Many people that he healed, many people that tasted of the grace of God and the power of God, they never became soul winners. That's why he said now in chapter 9, the laborers are few. He said the harvest is plenteous, and the twelve disciples alone will not be able to finish the harvesting. And the men alone will not be able to finish the harvesting. If there is any doubt in your mind whether God wants the women to take part in the harvesting, you've seen about the woman of Samaria. She knew the Lord. She went to the city, come see a man that told me everything that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? And as a result of her preaching, many of them in Samaria, they came to the Lord. In verse 38, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. That is, laborers are needed, the harvesters are needed, the soul winners are needed, the people to bring the whiting field into the Ghana and into the kingdom, we need them. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers forth into the harvest field. If you look at verse 37, then said he unto his disciples. He was telling the believers to pray that God will send forth laborers into the harvest field. Chapter 10 verse 1. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against the unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. In verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth. Those were the people who were praying. He said, pray that the Lord will send harvesters into the harvest field. While they were praying, he called them, those praying people themselves. He said, it's not only to pray, go out as well. Which means, I'm not only supposed to pray for people to be saved, I am also to become a soul winner myself. We are praying for souls to be saved. You must move from that point and then be able to say, we are preaching for the souls to be saved. In verse 7, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus began to call other people to get involved. And the scope of the harvesting is so wide, the extent is so unlimited, that he needs many, many people to get involved. In Luke chapter 9 from verse 57. Luke 9, 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, For six apples and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Pray that the Lord will send laborers into the harvest. The Lord wanted people to join the working team. But he also wants us to understand it is not a call to the bed of roses. There will be inconvenience. There will be labor, there will be tears, there will be sweating. And this man came and said, I will follow you whithersoever you go. And the Lord said, it's not for the people that are looking for convenience and luxury, it's looking for the people that are ready to work. 
not for the people that are looking for immediate reward. If I go out and evangelize, what's my immediate reward? I said, foxy suppose, birds of the happiness, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Although we want to sign up and work for the Lord, what's your motivation? What are you looking for? Are you just looking for the salvation of the souls? Or is it that you want an immediate response, immediate reward, immediate remuneration? Why don't you understand that foxes and fools, birds of the happiness, but look at the Son of Man, he had nowhere to lay his head. In verse 59, and he said unto another, follow me. This one was very slow. He was not even thinking of following the Lord. Until the Lord spoke to him directly, follow me. Ah, but he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. You see, there are people that want some legitimate things to hinder their commitment to the Lord. It's legitimate to bury the father at the father's night. But if that burial comes between you and your service to the Lord, something is wrong. It's legitimate to take care of members of your family. But if that family responsibility comes between you and the service of the Lord, something is wrong. In verse 60, Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You know that there are people today who say they are believers, they will abandon soul winning, they will abandon the work of God, they want to carry out the burial ceremony the way they do it in their state, the way they do it in their tribe, and they will take time, they will go through ceremonies, they will hide themselves there, they spend all the money they have got on that burial ceremony, and the work of God will be suffering. The work of God is so changed. Harvesting souls into the kingdom is so changed. And he says, rise up and do it. In verse 61, another said, also, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid farewell uh, to them which are at home, at my house. There is nothing wrong if you want to go out to tell your wife at home, I want to go out. There is nothing wrong you tell your husband, I want to go out. If some people are living with you or you are living with some people, you want to go out. There's nothing wrong in saying, I want to go out and reach there before I come back. But when we have to tie that down to so winning and say, well, I will talk to them. If they give me permission, if they are happy with my consecration, if they are happy with my so winning, then I will come and follow you. Something is wrong. If my husband approves my evangelism and approves my telling people to be born again, then I will do it. If my husband does not approve, well, I will think of what to do. Something is wrong. If my family members, if they approve of my preaching the gospel, standing up in the public and declaring that Jesus is Lord and Savior, if they approve of it, I will do it. If they don't approve, then I will consider my stand. Then something is wrong. He said, Lord, if I am left alone, were it not for the connection and the trade and the wagon that I have, were it not for the people that are associated with me, if it were myself alone, I will follow you. If I were alone, no other person with me, no association with anyone, and there is nobody that will approve or disapprove, I will give all my time, all my life, I will work. But you see, there are some people at home, let me sound their opinion. Look at verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You see those three people, there is no record that they were able to follow the law. Look at chapter 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also. Thank God if there are three people that reject, there are 70 people that are waiting to be appointed to service. If there are three carnal people that reject the call of God because of human, earthly, carnal consideration, there are 70 people that are willing to say yes to the Lord. If these ones hold their peace, God will raise up stones and they will publicize His name. There are three people that have faded out of uh, the presence of the Lord and there is no record of their name and there is no record of their destiny. But when they faded out, 70 people rose up. You will make up your mind whether you will be among the people that fade away without any responsibility, without doing something in the kingdom, or you will be among the people that are waiting and you will say, Here am I, Lord. I am available. Send me. 
after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. When he had twelve people, he said, The laborers are few. Now that he had seventy, he still said, The laborers are few. We already have some workers, but the laborers are few. We already have some uh, house fellowship leaders, but the laborers are few. You can see we already have choir, but the laborers are few. You will see we already have coordinators. But as you look at the population of this uh, city, the laborers are few. And uh, more and more people are coming to this city. And children are being born. You will see that with the many churches there are in the city, and with the districts we have, and the work we are doing in this city, you will think now we have enough workers, we don't need to bother ourselves anymore. After Jesus got the twelve and the seventy, he sent them forth. While they were going, he said, when you get there, you'll see. The harvest truly really is great, but the laborers are few. The work is much. I pray you will get involved. I pray you will be a soul winner. You will be an harvester. And the blessings of a service will come upon your life in Jesus' name. God had a controversy with the children of Israel. It was because they didn't recognize they were there at that special time to get involved in the harvesting they needed to do. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 24. Jeremiah 5 24. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain both the former and the latter in a season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. The problem he had with the children of Israel is that they didn't realize that the time they had to spend on earth was the appointed weeks of the harvest. This is our own time. The appointed weeks of the harvest. And if you get involved, because once the harvesting time is over, there will be no work to do for you at that time. That's why the Lord himself said, I must walk while it is day. The night cometh when no man can walk. What's the Lord then requiring from you and from me? Point number two, surrendering all to God. Surrendering all to God. The Lord doesn't want you to reserve anything for yourself. He wants you to come before Him and say, I know the laborers are few. Get me involved. I surrender everything I've got for the work of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 23 verse 26. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 26. My son, give me thine heart. Let thine eyes observe my ways. Of course, you know, if I have given you something, you will not be asking me to give it to you again. When you know it's in your hand, it's in your possession, it's available for your use. These people were referred to as my son. You will think then naturally they were totally in the possession of the Lord. But no, if they were totally in the possession of the Lord, why will he be telling them, give me thine heart? We are born again and the Lord is still telling us, give me thine heart. We are the sons and the daughters of the Lord, and the Lord is still pleading with us, Give me thine heart. We are singing the song, All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. And yet, you say, you sing it in song, Let me see the practical manifestation, Give me thine heart. He's reminding us, I left all for you. What have you given unto me? Give me thine heart. He's reminding us we have been bought with a price. And so when he tells us to give him our heart, he's telling us, I purchased that thing, I bought that thing, surrender it, I paid for it already. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, and which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? There are believers that spend their time and their lives selfishly for themselves. And they will not spend their lives for the Lord. He said, what are you doing? Don't you know you are not your own? 
there are people in the budgeting and in the plan of spending their money, spending their time, spending their youthful days, and spending everything they have. They have no record for God except just to come to the service. And when they come to the service, it's God, give me more, give me more. They are not giving anything to the Lord. They are not giving their time. They are intelligent enough. They are clever enough. They, are, they know the scripture enough. They are real children of God. There is no budgeting. There is no planning to serve the Lord and work for the Lord in the church of God. He said, what are you doing? Don't you know you are not your own? Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me. Please, I want you to read that with the understanding of the New Testament. If you read it with the understanding of the Old Testament, you'll be limiting that verse to tithes and offering. You'll be pointing a killing finger to the children of Israel. You will be saying, ah, oh, what a pity. Look at these children of Israel, how ungrateful they were that God gave them so much money and they couldn't return one tenth to the Lord. But instead of pointing the accusing finger to the children of Israel, point it to yourself. It says, you are bought with a price. And you do not belong to yourself. It's not just money. Your heart, your spirit, your mind, your intelligence, your wisdom, your talent, your body, everything belongs to the Lord. Ye are not your own. And you are withdrawing that thing from God. Will you rob God? 24 hours of the day, you cannot spend 30 minutes to even talk about Christ and to harvest souls into the kingdom. And you are bought with a price. You do not belong to yourself. Will you rob God? And uh, here you are, you may say, well, I'm already a worker. You are a worker, but when going from the office, from your house to the office, you never talk about Christ, you never preach. When you come back, you want to do another extra job so you can get more money. And all the people you are meeting, you never have their souls into the kingdom. And the harvest is plenteous, and the laborers are few. And you never spend your time and your talent for the Lord, even though you go by the label of worker. Will you rob God? And so it says, will a man rob God, yet he have robbed me? In the Old Testament, it was tied. In the New Testament, our whole life, our body, our spirit, they don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. You give everything to the Lord. Actually, God frowns at our stealing from Him, robbing Him. Agai chapter 1, reading from verse 2. Just speak at the Lord of all, saying, The people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of all, Consider your ways. Ye have so much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. He clothes you, but there is none warm. And he that honeth wages, honeth uh, wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your way. In verse 9, ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste, and ye run every man to his own house. You see the attitude of God to the people that are robbing God? The people that are saying, not yet time. You have been saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost for five years, ten years. Not yet time to evangelize. You have been healed and delivered. Not yet time to testify. We are pleading with you. We are begging you. We are calling you. We are pulling you. We need somebody in the house fellowship. We need somebody there. Not yet time. I have some other things to do. And because of that, God said, he blew on what they had, and it became almost nothing. Then he says, consider your way. See why my children are poor. See the reason why my children bring in much, and they labor much, and they have little. God is fighting with his own children. He is saying because they are sitting in their sealed houses, they are not doing the work of God, they are selfishly running to their work, and they leave the harvest of souls, and they leave the building of his temple, the church is a building, the building that is the, the, the temple of God. Because they leave the temple of God, and they run to their own houses, they brought in much, I blew upon it, it became little. And you see these people, when a guy rebuked them, immediately they rose up. And they began to do the work he wanted them to do. Look at chapter 2 verse 19. Because they responded immediately to the call of the Lord. 
He said, look at it now. It's the seed yet in the barn. He has yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree has not brought forth. Then he said, because of your obedience, because of your rising up, because of your yieldedness, because of bringing back what you are stolen away unto me, from this day I will bless you. Obedience brings blessing. Involvement in the work of God brings blessing. Not involvement just in name, but in practice and in reality. Not just saying I'm a worker, full time or part time, but doing the work with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, whatever your hand finds to do for the Lord, you do it with everything you have got. That's what God will bless. And if you will come to surrender everything to the Lord today and say, Lord, I know that when I became born again, when I came to the Lord, I promised I was going to serve the Lord without looking at anybody's bad example, without looking at those who are evangelizing, those who are not evangelizing. I bring everything back today. I lay it upon the altar. The blessing of God will begin to flow in your life in Jesus' name. Let me go to point number three. Serving God till the end. Ah, there are many people that start. They start with zeal. They start with commitment. And they labor at the beginning. But you know, as we go on in the work of the Lord, many, many, many things will happen. It's always like that. Look at the ministry of Moses. Many, many things happen as they were joining onto the land of Canaan. Some people will appreciate the work. Some people are not going to appreciate the work. Look at Joshua. Many things happen along the line. Look at Elijah. Many things happen along the line. And look at Elisha too. Look at David. The first time that Saul met David. Whose son is this large? He loved him. And he would not allow him to go to his father's house anymore. Ah, but he did not continue like that. When we are serving the Lord, many, many things will happen along the way. There will be those who appreciate. There will be those who do not appreciate. There will be those who praise us. There will be those who blame us. There will be those who support. There will be those who will hinder. But you see all the people that we read about in the Bible. Many of them, those who are committed, they did it to the very end. And it's important serving God to the end. Serving God to the end. In John chapter 9 verse 4. John chapter 9 verse 4. I must walk the works of him that sent me. Those were the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know something? Jesus never looked at circumstances around him in doing the work of God. If he looked at those things happening around him, he would never have even started. Herod raising up people to slay him, to kill him, even at the point of his birth. Immediately announced the spirit of the Lord is upon me. In that same chapter, they wanted to throw him down so that he will die. He gave only one message and the Pharisees were already having a counsel on how they will kill him. He healed in the synagogue and immediately after that healing on, in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, they were conspiring together to slay him. He cast out devils immediately. They raised up the old. They said it's by the spirit of Beelzebub. He is doing that. That's not the power of God. And the people that he healed and the people that he delivered, those were the people eventually say, give us a Barabbas and kill this Jesus and crucify him. If you look at the wind and the cloud, they will not sow. You will start, you will not be able to finish. But Jesus decided he would only look at him that sent him. I must want the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Make the best of the day. The day of opportunity. The day of service. The day of evangelism. The day when souls are still available to be saved. The time is coming. When your eyes will be closed. When you will be carried out of the world. When there will be no more opportunity. A time is coming. When those sinners will not be there anymore. A time is coming. When the day of service will end. And even if you wanted to serve at that time. The Lord will say the time is over. But now today. When the Lord is giving us a spirit. When the Lord is quickening us and stirring us up. When the Lord is pointing towards the things that must be done. When there is joy in the service of the Lord. When the rapture had not taken place. When the Antichrist has not occupied the world. When it will not be that anybody that talks about Christ will be beheaded. This time of the day. When there is opportunity. When we can serve the Lord. I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh. And the night is not going to wait for anybody. 
The night will not stay well, you are still uh, you are still to do your work. Let me not arrive yet. The timetable of the Lord will not be delayed for you. This is your chance. This is your opportunity to look around you. What can I do for the Lord? Overlook whatever people say, whatever people think about you. Overlook the Pharisees. They will always be there. Overlook the Sadducees. The people that never appreciate anything that is done for the Almighty. They will always be there. Overlook the, ac- the accusers and the, crit- and the one that are criticizing. And look unto him that sent you into this world and brought you into the kingdom at such a time like this. It says, I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day. That was the, the, the attitude of Paul the Apostle. He wanted to do the work of the Lord without considering what anybody was saying. In Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many, many tears. And temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. There you see that the tears were there. Paul said, yes, the tears are there, but the work is there too. Are there trials? Trials and temptations were there, but the work is there too. And uh, there are the people that are waiting for him to criticize every good thing he did. Oh yes, the people were there, but the work of God was there too. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greek, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm still doing it, testifying, preaching, exhorting, calling them on faith and repentance. Verse 22, now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Oh, he said, you see, I don't even know what I'm expecting. I'm going to Jerusalem. I still want to go and preach there. I do not know what they will do to me. The burden, the agony, the sin that he may suffer. He said, it's waiting for me. I don't know what will happen, but I have to go out to preach the word of God. In verse 23, said that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bounds and afflictions abide me. He said, imprisonment is waiting for me. The rejection is waiting for me. Opposition is waiting for me. There is nobody to appreciate the evangelism he was doing. In verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's a person like you and me. He said, all the problems are there. I don't worry about all those things. I want to finish what God has given me to do. Serving the Lord till the very end. Philippians chapter 2 verse 25. Philippians chapter 2 verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger that he he that ministered unto my wants. How did he work for God, this Epaphroditus? What was his commitment to the work of the Lord? Look at first 30. Because for the work of Christ, he was near unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Can you think of somebody evangelizing to the point of getting sick? Can you think of somebody preaching until he loses his voice? Can you think of somebody doing the work of God to the point he even neglects to take care of himself, working for God until he became sick, near unto death, working for God? To manifest a good spirit today. But the Lord wants us to carry that into evangelism. That rain or no rain, flood or no flood, difficulty or no difficulty, we will evangelize. The people are perishing. They need to be brought to the kingdom of God. Second Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23 verse 10. He arose and he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord, the, the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. It was a day of battle. The Philistines, the enemy of God and the enemy of the people of God were fighting against the people of God. Even the rest of the people, many people were already tired, they were worn out, they were weary, and they had already left the battlefield. This one man was left alone on the front line, fighting against the Philistines, smiting the Philistines. His hands, his hand was weary. He almost could not lift up his hand again. 
And even his fingers were stuck unto the, on the, on the sword. He couldn't stretch those hands anymore. And yet he kept on fighting. He said, the end has not come. All the Philistines have not been destroyed. The work has not been finished. Although I am weary, although my hand is weary, although my fingers are cleaving to the sword, I must go on. And there was a great victory. And the many people that had led the battlefield, when they saw his challenging example, they returned to spoil. That was Old Testament. Jesus had not come. He wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost. He didn't know about the great privileges of the new covenant. But he was so dedicated to the service of the Lord of that day. Although weary and tired and worn out, he said, I must continue to the end. And the people of the new covenant generation, we should be better than the Old Testament. And we should say, whatever is happening along the way, I want to serve the Lord to the very end. Revelation chapter 2 before we pray. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 25. But that which ye already have, hold fast till I come. This is not the time to be careless. You have something from the Lord, hold it fast. You have the word of the Lord, hold it fast. You have a conviction from the Lord, hold it fast. You have sound doctrine, hold it fast. You have opportunity in the house of the Lord to serve the Lord, hold it fast. You have a zeal in your heart, hold on to that zeal. You are given a place to serve in the, in the house of the Lord, hold that opportunity. Don't toss it away because of a little excuse. Verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Keep not only the word, but the work of God unto the end. Don't forsake the work of God and say, well, I'm still a Christian. And that I don't evangelize doesn't mean I'm no more in the kingdom. That I've let my responsibility doesn't mean that I don't love God. Well, the words of Jesus Christ is, He that overcometh and keepeth my works, not just word, my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I have received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Lord has already told us today we need to do the work of God. Time is short, eternity is long. And you will only be remembered by what you have done. If you waste all this privilege and time of opportunity, on the other side, you'll be ashamed for all eternity. But why don't you walk until the end of the way and keep on doing that work? You may be tired. People may oppose you. It may appear that uh, there's not enough money to spend. Do the work of God. We will do it. I said we will do it. Rise up and tell the Lord that you'll be consecrated to this end time harvest. Evangelization. Talking to other people about the Lord. Don't always be a person that will come to the house of God, say, no, Lord, give me this, give me this, give me this today. You give your time, you give your heart, you give everything you have got for the service of the Lord. Be a New Testament believer. The New Testament believers were not always asking, give me, give me, give me. They were giving themselves to the Lord. The New Testament believers went through opposition, criticism, difficulty, hindrances, persecution, and they serve the Lord. What are you doing for the Lord? What are you doing for the Lord? Why don't you tell the Lord? You will evangelize. Many people are waiting to hear the gospel from you. Are you going to be spiritually barren? There is no convert in your ministry. You are not really serving the Lord with all your heart. You are listening to the criticism of Pharisees and Sadducees. You are looking at the hindrances and the stumbling blocks of the devil. Yeah, they don't appreciate me in the house fellowship. I will not do my best there anymore. Serve the Lord with a smile. Whatever the difficulty, whatever the criticism, while I served the Lord so much I became sick. Well, you are not the first person. Keep on serving the Lord. 
After all, your body belongs to the Lord. Your soul belongs to the Lord. Your spirit belongs to the Lord. Your time belongs to the Lord. Your talent belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. Or will you rob God? Will you rob God? Are you being indolent in the work of God and say, Well, after all, nobody appreciates me. Come back to the altar and lay everything upon the altar. And determine that you will serve the Lord till the very end of your life. Not only coming to church. Coming to church is wonderful. Are you winning souls? Do you know you are in the world to bring souls into the kingdom? Serve the Lord joyfully. Not grudgingly. Not with murmuring. Serve Him joyfully. And preach the gospel everywhere you go. Tell the lost of the Savior who came to die for them. Bring them in. Plead with them. Rescue the perishing. Tell them they don't have to die in their sin. If they will repent and believe, the Lord will forgive and save them. Bring everything that you have taken away from the Lord. Bring it back to the altar. Serve the Lord with all your strength, all your talent. Give everything you have got into the service of the Lord. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, he says, I will bless and I will reward in eternity. Keep on doing it till the very end. You don't go back. If you lay your hands on the plan, you look back, you are no more fit for the kingdom of God. And there is no other time. This is the time. There is no other thing. This is a thing to do. There is no other place. Here is a place to do it. There is no other chance. Here is your only chance. Give it everything you have got. The time will come when there will be no privilege again. Serve the Lord to the very end. 